Hey everybody, this is Andy, aka Love Retro BTW, across Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. I do a podcast every Saturday called Cafe BTW, a morning gaming podcast, a retrospective look at the wonderful world of retro gaming from interviews to guests. Join us every Saturday, like a Saturday morning cartoon starting at 8 a.m., 11 a.m. Eastern. Also, if you're on Twitter, please join the brand new retro gaming community, a place to share, connect, and show your love for the retro gaming community. All the links are down below. And remember, enjoy the Gamers Week podcast. This time on Gamers Week podcast. And so concludes the first annual Atari 2600 Space Invaders Tournament. The judges will now go and tally their scores, blah, 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 and determine the winner. And then I just looked at the uh, announcer and says, does that mean we don't have to play anymore? <laughs> That's right. You don't have to play anymore. And then, of course, I thank my lucky stars in having the forethought of not drinking any water before the tournament mm. started. Because immediately I saw, um, I think the guy from Dallas, it was, got up and ran to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hold it any longer. Like, I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to let my bladder make me lose. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll be in my chair if I have to. <laughs> I, I would have. That's dedication. Yep. Yep. I want to do that uh, duet thing on TikTok with the evil villain thing, but I've been watching a lot of a lot of Letterkenny lately. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be, oh, look at this hmm, little tiny morsel coming to me to get something to eat, hmm. and I was just getting to be hungry too. Hmm. <laughs> There's no such thing as heroes and villains, okay? <laughs> <You're all good. laughs> Only heroes like to paint themselves like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Should see the guy from a Family Guy, the, uh, the old man. You know? Look, little lambs come to play with the wool. <laughs> exactly. Oh my god. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to Gamers Week podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, worst, and weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode twenty-three. Jordan, today is Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. My name is Donnie G. Retro, and I will be your carnival barker for the evening. With me are my very two good friends and hosts, co-hosts. One of them puts the poo in poutine. (laughs) (laughs) And the other was caught using tilt controls in Mario Kart. Boo, boo them, boo hissed. Dare you? Shame, shame. Uh, know your name. We'll let you figure out which one is which. <laughs> We've got Ryan, aka Retro Game Brews, and Blue, aka Writer's View. How are you guys doing tonight? Apparently, uh, a little smelly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm going to have poutine ever again. <laughs> So tonight we have a very special interview with Rebecca Heineman. She's a longtime veteran of the video game industry, a founding member of several video game companies such as Interplay Productions and Logicware, and is part of the board of directors of the LGBTQ plus organization GLAAD. Not to mention she is considered to be the first ever national video game tournament champion. She'll be joining us later on in the show, so stick around for that. So let's go on to our reviews, reactions, and requests. Retro Blast US says, still waiting on the Bubble Bobble focused <laughs> episode where Donnie G Retro discusses his favorite game of all time. <laughs> Taking the Carnival Barker thing a little, little seriously. <laughs> I love that you had to read that about a game that you <laughs> You had to show passion and excitement. <laughs> Um, well, Retro Blast, th- it's not going to happen. Um, there will never be a Bubble Bobble focused episode. If there is, I will not be around for it. <laughs> it would be fun, though. You could just uh, trash on it for like a, an hour and a half. It's true. You are correct. 
Derek and Air says, I will double my Patreon support for an episode of just Donnie G being terrible at making prank <laughs> phone calls. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Hello? Uh, you're stupid. Click. <laughs> Burn. Good job. <laughs> Uh, you know that every single cell phone has caller ID? Yeah. You got to get one of those burner phones. <laughs> if you're really dedicated to it. <laughs> what, a, what a great investment for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's what your Patreon money goes towards, a burner phone for Donnie. Uh, right. That would be awesome. And Philip BZ says, you can buy stocks of a company without them knowing you are doing it. In the U.S., up to 9.99% of the whole company before having to publicly disclose the deal and let the SEC know about the trades. You are not wrong. That's why, I mean, I buy stocks, I guess, on a daily basis, just one or two or a couple hundred or whatever. But whenever you go to buy, like you just said, 10%, 20%, whatever, I think they want to know who's actually investing in the company. (laughs) Well, Saudi Arabia only bought 5% of Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> so when the rep said, uh, I don't know, right? that, that might have been a legit answer. Like, who knows, man? I don't, don't know where this money's coming from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't know how well this is going to work, so bear with me. All right. And now it's time for the... <laughs> what was that? She was eating yogurt mm-hmm. <laughs> just like Kev Bayless did. <laughs> oh, okay. I got it right away. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, 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 uh. Man, that's difficult. I can't wait to how that yeah, how that sounds in reverb. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds horrendous. <laughs> Apologies to everyone, <laughs> but I had to try it. Um, are we talking tapioca, strawberry, blueberry? Just plain Greek. Just plain yogurt. Even with strawberries. <clears throat> All right. Every Monday on Twitter, we post our VIP. That is our very important poll. And if you'd like to participate, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. So the question this week was, what is your favorite Konami game on the Super Nintendo? In third place was Sunset Riders with 11.3%. Second place was Super Castlevania with 32.2%. And the winner was Turtles in Time with 47.6%. We also had 8.9% of people vote other. And let's look at some of their comments. At Bulk Slash says... Axelay, but pretty much everything Konami released on the SNES was pure gold. At Can't Stop Rewind says, First SNES Parodius occupies a particularly warm and exotic place in my memory because I've never played it again since I was a kid. Sighs longingly. (laughs) At Dungeons Joypads said, Sunset Riders, Buster Bust Loose, Pop and Twinby, Biker Mice from Mars. What an era for Konami. At Bite Size Imp says Contra 3, followed closely by Turtles in Time and Castlevania 4. And at Ludo Timbo says Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Do publisher credits count? Totally. Totally. They count. We'll allow it. <laughs> I was going to say that, but then I looked, I was like, ah, they just, pu- they didn't develop it. So probably not. But hey, if anything goes, we'll accept it. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you vote, Donnie? Well, let me first start off by saying I am this day's old when I heard of Parodius. I've never heard of that game before. Oh. But for me, there was it was a tough choice. Um, you know, from the list here, Sunset Riders, great game. Super Castlevania, obviously a great game. Turtles in Time, of course, it's a great game. I own many world records for that game. However, that's not the one I chose because I have a I have an affinity for Contra 3, The Alien Wars. That was one of the first games that I ever received for my Super Nintendo uh, from my parents. And I believe it was for Christmas. And I played that game and played that game and played that game. And to this day, I don't think I've ever made it past the part where it's the top down view of the city street. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've never I've never progressed past that. So um, I do love Turtles in Time. So it was a tough choice for me. Sounds like maybe that'd be a good stream. 
where you finally no. get past that plateau? <laughs> well, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd have to put some practice in. He, he's at stage three. He's at the, uh, the four <laughs> stages of Donnie. <laughs> of the four stages of Donnie, right? I hated that game for the longest time, mainly because it was the only <laughs> game I owned for the Super Nintendo and I couldn't get past that. And I was like, you know, it's no it's no point in playing this game when I know every single time I'm going to get to this part and never progress. So I put it on the shelf and didn't touch it for the longest time. Okay. What about you, Ryan? Man, this is a tough call just because this is the golden era of Konami is the Super Nintendo. They they put out so many amazing titles as i think we kind of outlined in some of these answers it was a tough choice between turtles in time and sunset riders but turtles in time for me has so much nostalgic value it's a near perfect game the music is fantastic the gameplay elements the controls everything uh, the fact that you go back in time and then fight in different eras <laughs> of this planet including mm -hmm. uh one that i don't think is technically correct as to how far back it is <laughs> when it had dinosaurs but we're not going for historical accuracy here we're only going for awesome gameplay and it's super super fun uh so turtles in time is huge i mean i used to play that with my brother back in the day that was one of those games that we really enjoyed and uh, he actually bought me uh, when i was getting back into collecting a copy of turtles in time uh, with the manuals so that's yeah. also kind of the, the near and dear to my heart so yeah Turtles in Time is just the, it's the peak of excellence for Konami, in my opinion. And see, I never got to play Turtles in Time back when it first came out, because every time I go to Blockbuster, it was always rented out. Yeah, Which same. makes sense. <laughs> totally makes sense. That's one of those play as an adult games. Yep. Lou, what about you? What'd you pick? I think I know the answer, but we'll let you say it. Yeah, everybody does. I've gushed about it before <laughs> on the show. Super Castlevania, my favorite Castlevania game. So, uh, Turtles in Time is great, but I really love Castlevania, so that's going to edge it out for me every time. Well, the one thing I like about that game, though, is that it, it provides different gameplay elements. It's not just strictly your standard Castlevania platformer, which, you know, mm -hmm. one, two, and three pretty much are. Where this one, it, it has isometric view to it. There's a lot of different level designs and stuff. And the fact that you can do the wiggle whip is awesome. Wiggle, whip, wiggle, man. wiggle, wiggle. Yep. <laughs> And it works. It's not like it's just like a stupid game mechanic. You can use it to your advantage. There's right, some strategic yeah. right, element to it. Right. I don't know if that's the best video game weapon ever, but I'd make an argument to put it in a top 10. For sure. Yeah, it's a great strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to point out that out of all three of these games listed, I have beaten every single one of them. Uh, I don't think I played Sunset Riders more than two or three times. I cannot right, beat Richard Rose in Sunset Riders. I've tried oh. a lot of times, but I can't. But Castlevania and Turtles in Time, of course. There's a perfect spot for Richard Rose. I can show you. I can show you the spot. <laughs> You're going to show me the right spot? I will show you the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and shout out our patrons. We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. The Red Ox PDX family, including Shannon and Luke, Zach, huge thanks, Random Retro Dude, Princess Kitty Mew Mew, Rai Rise, I hate the secret best friend. We love it. <laughs> Mega Retro Man, Gametroid, Emo S, Bill Tucker, Rye Bread's number one fan, Fruitcake's number one stan, The Wizard of Zardoz, Clayman71, Great Saiyaman81, BNC Zilla Guy, Geek With That, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Terry Kinnair, Ducks in Disguise, Jim and Colleen, Games with Coffee, and Davey PGH. If you like what you hear today, and we really hope that you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing like prizes and giveaways. You also gain access to our weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut. Patrons with benefits, visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Let's go ahead and take a look at the headlines for this week. Our headline segment is proudly sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast. It's a fantastic, family-friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss, as well as news, interviews, and other topics. Currently, they're playing through NBA Jam and The Legend of Cage. 
Visit them at it's, retrogameclub.com. Hmm? It's Kage. Um, excuse me? Did you, what? Uh, that's like a Gaiden Gaiden. <laughs> like oh. No, it's really not. <laughs> Growing no. up, Legend of Cage was how I pronounced yep. that's it. That's how you pronounce it in America, but the Japanese pronunciation is Kage. We're going to go ahead and keep it as Cage. As long as I'm reading the copy, it's Cage. All right. Everybody who wants to add Gamers Week podcast and let us know what's wrong, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, they're playing through NBA Jam and the Legend of Cage. Visit them at retrogameclub.net or follow the link in the show notes. So, NBA Jam, great game. Super frustrating, yes. but it's still a great game. Legend of Kage, I hate that game so what? much. What? Why? It, I think it everybody so, hates that game. It's so janky. <laughs> it is so incredibly janky. And the arcade ain't any better. <laughs> so it's not mm-hmm. like they they ruined it by bringing it to the NES. It was already bad. The the, the source material sucked. But uh, there are people who I think speed run that game. So bless those folks. <laughs> I think you can find somebody who speed runs just about any game if you look hard Fair. enough. <laughs> so I will say that I've always pronounced it as Legend of Cage. My wife pronounces it as Legend of Cage. Her brothers pronounce it as Legend of Cage. That's all I've ever heard it. This is the first time I've heard somebody pronounce it differently i wasn't um actually you i was trying to just <laughs> you sure you correct. yes we do that occasionally from time to time when one of us doesn't know how to pronounce a word kage <sighs> you you pronounce it how you like thank you you're welcome <laughs> From GameSpot, Xbox outsells PlayStation in Japan for the first time since 2014. Hmm. The sales in Japan for Xbox Series S last week surpassed those of PlayStation 5, making this the first time an Xbox console has outsold a PlayStation in any given week since 2014. Somebody do some quick math. How many weeks is that? Oh, God. Uh, (laughs) 52 weeks a year. 12 times uh, 7 eight years. is 84. Uh, no, not weeks. Damn, I was doing months. So that's even harder. <laughs> well, yeah. it's 2014, times, 2022. That's 8 times 50 oh, is right. 400. It's so, eight. yeah. Moving on. Moving on. This specific <laughs> incident is most likely due to the low supply of PlayStation 5 consoles, whereas Xbox Series S supply is more plentiful. Last year, Sony reportedly told analysts that shortages for its latest console will continue through 2022. The Xbox brand isn't as popular overseas in Japan compared to its homegrown competitors, PlayStation and Nintendo. At the very least, Xbox Series X and S sales have already surpassed Xbox One's lifetime sales in Japan. Microsoft understands that the Japanese market, as well as the broader Asian market, is important. It says that Xbox is seeing phenomenal growth there. While Xbox still has work to do in Japan, it does have a Japanese studio within its first-party portfolio, Tango Gameworks. The studio recently released Ghostwire Tokyo, but it is currently a timed console exclusive on PlayStation 5 and is expected to launch sometime next year on Microsoft platforms. Um, this is this is a significant swing, even though it only is one week. So sure. in, in the grand scheme of the last eight years, obviously PlayStation is winning over in Japan. But I think it does go to show that as time is going on, these two consoles are becoming more and more the same. More mm-hmm. and more, it doesn't matter which one you get. Whichever one is on the shelf, that's what you should grab. Right. Aside from these really big exclusives, something like Horizon Forbidden West, you would have to get the PlayStation. But so many of them are timed exclusives now. Like it's saying Microsoft has a Japanese studio, but then the game is a timed PlayStation exclusive. That's a little strange. But eventually it will go to Xbox. And so it's the kind of thing, if you're just a little patient, it doesn't matter which one you get. So in a large way, the console wars are pretty meaningless now. But man, did this put some fuel in the fire when it comes to Xbox fans? Like, oh, what's up, Sony fans? What's going on? (laughs) Pony boys, this is what's up. (laughs) Good job. You won a week. Out of the last 400 plus weeks, you won a week. <laughs> and I think that the the Game Pass has to play a role in this too, though, in the sense that it, it's super easy 
to now own an Xbox and pay nine ninety nine a month or whatever that that cost is in Japan, uh, and get a lot of access to games that you can play without having to ho- buy a whole lot. So basically, it turns into a pretty small investment to become a gamer on Xbox nowadays. Yeah, especially so, the Series S. As far as things go, yeah, right. I mean, you're not looking at uh, putting up six hundred dollars up front. You can put what it, it's it's somewhere on the three hundred dollars right now, and you get modern games, stuff that is up to date. If you really want to purchase one particular game, you can do it, but you don't have to. Uh, and the fact that Sony they've had issues in regards to their logistics and being able to supply this console that's killing them this generation. Honestly, with Xbox taking the swing with Game Pass and the fact that they can't produce enough PlayStation 5s, I'm not going to say that it will happen, but with the way the last generation went where Sony just dunked on Xbox, uh, Xbox is finally coming off the ropes, if you will, uh, and saying, hey, we're still here. So why is PlayStation or why is Sony having a problem manufacturing these consoles and Microsoft is not? I don't think it is that Microsoft is managing a chip shortage better than Sony. They're probably equal. It's just Mm -hmm. that over in Japan, I believe the prevailing thought is that nobody even considers uh, an Xbox over there. Right. So years. Yeah. So it just seems like there's more Xboxes available uh, than anywhere else, but really there's not. It's just that people are going, oh, hey, look at this other box. That, That is a good point. I didn't even think about that. But I also do like that it says where, uh, uh, at the very least, Xbox Series X and S sales have already surpassed Xbox One's lifetime sales after right. only a year and a half. That's so, right. yeah, that really just goes to show how badly the Xbox One, it, it wasn't a complete dumpster fire. I mean, it was at first, and then they kind of reworked it and resold it, and, and it was less of a dumpster fire, but they were really never able to recover with that console. But interestingly enough, the Xbox 360 did very well. I don't know how they did in Japan, though. So this Japanese market, the fact that it's starting to see some momentum is a good thing for Xbox. That's for sure. Right. Because historically, they have never really made a headway uh, when it comes to Japanese gamers. So VGC put out an article in March that said Japan has bought 2.3 million Xbox consoles in the last 20 years. That is wow. brutal. Yeah. Like New York City has probably bought more. Than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's insane. It's, it's like Microsoft is getting a shot in at the champ and you take it where you can get it. I guess so. Even if it was a sucker punch. Hey, right. <laughs> scoreboard. <laughs> yep. we, we, we stunned them. The judges are going to score in our favor. Let's just move on with the round. We know we're going to get knocked out here eventually, but hey, at least we're going to earn this money. <laughs> yeah. Next up from Games Radar, Activision Blizzard employees form first major North American games union, hope to inspire growing movement of workers. Activision Blizzard subsidiary and Call of Duty Warzone developer Raven Software has officially formed the first union among North America's major video game studios. The Game Workers Alliance, backed by Communication Workers of America, announced the results of the studio's union vote during a Twitter stream earlier today. Jessica Gonzalez, a campaign organizer for GWA, shared a live update of the results, which immediately looked in favor of unionization and reached a near unanimous unanimous 19 to 2 vote during the stream in the run-up to today's vote raven's employees accused activision of trying to stop our union every step of the way after months of organizing which included prolonged protests sparked by the abrupt dismissal of studio contractors activision did everything it could including breaking the law to try to prevent the raven qa workers from forming their union said CWA Secretary Treasurer Sarah Steffens. It didn't work, and we are thrilled to welcome them as a CWA members. Activision Blizzard has released a statement which reads, we respect and believe in the right of all employees to decide whether or not to support or vote for a union. We believe that an important decision that will impact the entire Raven Studio software of roughly 350 people should not be made by 19 Raven employees. What? (laughs) 
Okay. You, you get people to represent the greater population. Do, are they are they dummies here? <laughs> you got to spin it, man. This is Activision oh we're talking about. They are grasping at straws. That is that just makes you look stupid, in my opinion. <laughs> and I've actually I've, I've looked into this a little bit more because I found this to be super super interesting. And the tactics that Blizzard has done are, are pretty shady. So one of them. In December, they fired, I think it was 10 or so contractors out of the, the total 29 that right. were QA testers. And the rest of the employees did a walkout to protest that, right? And so what Activision did was like, hey, by the way, um, now that you're interested in unionizing, uh, we're going to raise your your wages to $20 an hour for minimum wage, and we're going to offer you benefits. But we reported on that. All right, but we can't offer that to anyone who unionizes. Oh, and then ex- snap. Right, right. Yeah. And their excuse was, oh, the reason we don't want to do that is because it would be against the law to try to uh, essentially coerce people into not voting for the union. But that's exactly <laughs> what they did, right? <laughs> yep. The, I, I, the, the direct quote from that was uh, that they... Uh, Under federal law, they could not encourage workers from voting against unionization by offering pay hikes or benefits. Union leaders, however, repudiated that argument pretty darn quick. (laughs) Wow. Yep. Yep. I got to be honest with you at the end of the day. I think this is a good thing. And the reason I'm going to say that is that if you look at the modern business model, I mean, these are contract folks. they're, They're more than likely 1099s. So they have almost no benefits. Uh, they can be fired for sneezing too loud in the in the lobby. And at the end of the day, they are taking it upon themselves to say, we, we would like to be able to make some decisions for ourselves. And I'm okay with that. I know that not everyone's a huge pro-union person. And in the past, unions have been troubling at times. But if you go back to the 1920s, 1910s, uh, when unions were first starting to become a, a thing, it was to combat stuff like this, where business leaders were treating their employees like dirt. I mean, honestly, the the five day work week and the eight hour day are a result of unions and child labor laws. Well, that's that's true, and child labor laws as well. So uh, you can thank your local rep, union rep for that. And I, I, like I said, at the end of the day, I'm okay with that. I think that eventually, though, that. Having the first one come into North America uh, will more than likely lead to more. Activision Blizzard has no one to blame for this but themselves. Absolutely. If they had just been fair, even relatively fair, maybe not a good place to work, but an okay place to work. Right. This wouldn't have happened. This is a direct result of them treating people like And I have, there's no love lost here on my part for Activision Blizzard or any company who wants to sit there and try to prevent their employees or contractors from unionizing to have a better treatment, a fair treatment. Even though you play Warzone more than anything else? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, sorry. I could actually, you know what? I, I could go ahead and uninstall that game, no problem whatsoever, and be completely fine with having it out of my life. Do really? It. <laughs> I do not believe you. No offense. I do not believe you. You know that, you know that gif with um, uh, Keegan, Michael Key, who's uh, just sitting there sweating and he's just looking mm-hmm. at that's going on right now. I'm, I'm waiting. Isn't for that, that that's well. Jordan Peele, isn't it? It is Jordan Peele. Whatever. Yeah. Jordan Peele, whoever. One of the <laughs> Keegan <Key> Peele guys. <laughs> <laughs> yep. From VGC, Sega says it's targeting high review scores for Sonic Frontiers. Set for release in holiday 2022, the open world Frontiers is Sega's most ambitious Sonic title for some years. Asked during a recent analyst and investor Q&A session about whether it had target scores for review aggregation sites such as Metacritic, Sega Sammy's CEO Haruki Satomi and CFO Koichi Fukuzawa confirmed that this is the case. We have set internal targets as the correlation between the scores of external evaluation organizations and sales is high in Europe and North America, they said. If the game gets a high score, it can become a must-buy game. 
During its recent financial results briefing, Sega also said the Sonic IP is currently riding high, thanks in part to the success of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie sequel, which it called a major hit. Sonic team head Takashi Aizuka has said he'd like Frontiers to have the same lasting impact as Sonic Adventure. Sonic Adventure laid the foundation for 20 years of Sonic titles after its release. So in the same way, I really hope that this new title releasing in 2022 lays the foundation for the following future Sonic titles. That's the idea behind the challenge for the team, Zuka said. So I guess this is interesting because do you think that review scores really make that big of a difference on sales of a game? Of course, because it's it's basically the people in the industry telling you whether or not this is a good game. But I, I'm of a mind where I don't really look at a lot of the reviews because people say the same thing about movies. They bash a movie and they're like, oh, no, the critics are like, eh, no, this movie stinks. It's a dumpster fire. But yet you go and see it and it's it's an amazing movie. Different folks, right. different tastes. That's kind of what I was wondering, because unless a review score is like really bad, like Balin Wonderworld bad, <laughs> it wouldn't scare me away from a game. And conversely, every time game scores, you know, it's a 9.9, .9, it's a 10, whatever. I don't really believe it because there's so much controversy about whether or not outlets are pressured to give high scores. Right. So personally, and I think for most everybody that I know, review scores are just kind of like extra noise in the background that don't really influence decisions to buy a game. And I think specifically for Sonic fans, I don't think there's any score that anybody could give this game that would make Sonic fans change their mind about whether or not they're going to buy it. Right. I mean, it sounds to me when they said external evaluation organization and sales is high in Europe and North America, uh, and there's a strong correlation between it. There's got to be some data set out there that they took a look at and said, hey, look, high scores mean high sales. But I think that for the most part, to, I think you nailed it on the head, Blue, is that this game is intended to appeal to Sega and Sonic fans, and they don't care necessarily what that score is going to be but also there's a thought to me as well is that if you're going to say outright we're looking for high scores on metacritic there will more than likely be people who will rate this game on purpose low uh in order to, ooh, to spite. Ooh, ooh, ooh. okay sorry i am on <laughs> uh i'm looking at a study called playing the critic a look at video game sales scores and genres um, and it says throughout our project, we want to investigate the relationship between critic score on the global sales of games. We also tested this effect of critic score as related to the genre of the game. Our data frame specifically tests the shooter, role playing, action sports, and racing games. And then when you scroll down to the conclusion, it says the sales of role playing games increases more than the others as the critic score increases however the global sales of video games of other genres are generally the same regardless of critic score interesting hmm. interesting this was in 2018 we're learning <laughs> and the fact that this is to my knowledge not an rpg that's telling it's open world maybe it's sonic rpg Oh, Sonic RPG. Uh, Would you guys be excited <laughs> for that or no? Nah. <laughs> I don't know how much <laughs> depth of character you could pull out of a Sonic RPG. Or do you I even mean, want to? Sometimes Sonic goes some really weird places. Yeah, like uh, making out with a human chick. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if it's an RPG and I don't really care what review scores are unless they're like really really bad but i want to see the gameplay and that's going to determine whether or not i will get this game i also wonder that because we're adults and we grew up without a whole lot of access to review scores we don't put as much clout as maybe the younger generation does because well i mean back in the day yeah you could go to nintendo power and look up games but most of the time you were just going to toys r us going that looks cool look at the look at the box art on that that's got to be awesome oh wait it's amagon <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had to learn to love a lot of really awful games exactly. we did we we didn't have the um you know the publications of of, of magazines like electronic gaming monthly and game pro didn't really become prominent until like the 
I'd say early to mid nineties. Right. So in the eighties, when the NES was popular, yeah, we didn't have, we, we had Nintendo power, which was great, but I, I honestly think that Nintendo power might've been biased. They might've been like, Oh, you no. gotta play this game. Yo, it's great. You know, it's, it's on Nintendo. Go buy it. Give us your money so you can play it and you get it. And it's complete. <laughs> shit. Whereas something in game pro or electronic gaming monthly, you know, they're, they're blunt and they're very open about it. Like, okay, this game is a snooze fest. It has no replay value. Don't waste your hard earned money on it. Or it's the greatest game since super Mario brothers. Go check it out. But the kids nowadays, I'm sounding like so old, like kids nowadays. We need to find a Gen Z person to tell us <laughs> what they, right, yes. how do you decide what video game to buy? Or you just don't even care and you're all playing free to play MMOs. <laughs> what's the, what's the free to play one? The Fortnite? big one? No, no, no. The, uh, the, um, that's constantly advertised on like mobile games and stuff like oh, that. Oh, um. Ryan. Raid Shadow Legends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Probably <laughs> playing Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our top three new releases for the week. All right, first up is Sniper Elite 5, out on the PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. The award-winning series returns as Carl Fairburn fights to uncover Project Kraken in 1944 France. Hey, another World War II game, Donnie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Genre-defining authentic sniping with enhanced kill cam has never looked or felt better as you fight across immersive maps to stop the Nazi war machine in its tracks. Arcade Spirits The New Challengers out on the PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Arcade Spirits The New Challengers is the follow-up to 2019's Arcade Spirits, a visual novel of love and pixels in which you seek friendship and romance while working in an arcade. Now the tables are turned as you seek friendship and romance while playing in an arcade. (laughs) Novel concept. (laughs) Hey, which slot can I put this quarter in? Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, KO the Kangaroo out on the PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Inspired by the golden age of 3D platformers, KO the Kangaroo returns in a whole new adventure. Embark on an epic journey, master magical gloves, explore lush environments, and take KO through his most grand tale yet. So, uh, out of this week's lineup, what are you looking at, Ryan? Personally, I would probably go with Sniper Elite 5. Since I am not inundated with uh, World War II games as much as Tani is, (laughs) uh, I think this would be a fun one to do. Uh, Love history, love World War II, so that that definitely would be uh, probably where I'd be leaning Uh, I am not a fan of visual novel games. I know our buddy Wizard of Zardoz, it's like one of his favorite genres, but I cannot get into it. The the whole seeking friendship and romance while working in an arcade, that sounds to me like such a snooze fest. (laughs) (laughs) To each their own. Indeed, indeed. And Cal the Kangaroo, I never played those, so I'm not familiar uh, with that series of games. Is it a series? I think it might be. It's, uh, no, I think there's only one release for the Dreamcast. There's one in 2000, 2003, 2005, and now there's one coming up in 2022. Oh, and the game. Holy crap. Okay. Ooh. I completely. Wow. I'm okay. slipping in my old age. <laughs> uh, no, not really. I've never heard of this. I know of it. I haven't played it. Only through collecting do I know of it. But it's made by Titus Interactive. So. That's got to be good, right? Who's that? Yay? <laughs> you don't know Titus. <laughs> oh my god! You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a bunch of games from Titus. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. There are a lot of games that came out. I mean, they they they're not great. Not all of them are great. Oh, Superman. What they did, Superman. Superman sixty four. Yeah. <laughs> Everything yes, you just did. said is null and void. Yes. <laughs> no, they did. Uh, they did. And published by Titus Interactive. Oh, yep. that's delicious. Uh, what were you never saying? Mind. I, I, I retract my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie, go uh, ahead. <laughs> 
Arcade Spirits, definitely not. Not my cup of tea. KO the Kangaroo. Yeah, it looks interesting. I might give it a shot. Um, you know, definitely don't want to drop enough money on it as a new release. Sniper Elite. Love the series. Um, I've played two and three, and there is just something interesting about the bullet time, the slow motion kill cam where like you could see the like when you when you shoot somebody with the bullet, it just like the travel time from your gun down to them, and then it goes in and basically and explodes their inner organs. Um, <laughs> that speaks to me. So <laughs> <laughs> I I liked how it was done in part three, uh, part two and part three. I skipped part four because I was just like, ah, eh, you know what? It's getting kind of boring and repetitive. But every so often, Steam will have a sale and they'll. They'll come out with these old titles that you can pick up for like a couple of bucks. And I think it might be time to pick up part four and see um, how it leads into part five. I'm looking forward to Sniper Elite 5. Well, who doesn't like shooting Nazis? Right. (laughs) Blue, what about you? What's your choice? I don't want any of these. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like shooters. I don't like visual novels. I do like platformers, but... The fact that this cow, the kangaroo, has been around so long and I've never heard of it, inspired by the golden age of 3D platformers. I mean, how many platformers are there that are just the generic animal mascot with the generic platforming challenges that just rehash everything that has already been done before? They don't add a single thing to the genre. Uh, Right. And what's going to be new about this one that's going to keep people interested? Right. You could drown in platformers if you wanted to. Right. You can't just make a new platformer and think people are going to come by it. There's got to be something special about it. And I just don't know what's special about this. And you know what? You don't have to choose. If if none of these games <laughs> yeah. uh, don't speak to you, then yeah, just be like, nope. Nope. Not going to do it. Gun to my head. Sure, the platformer. But short of a gun to my head, I'm not playing any of these. <laughs> Blue will be playing something from her backlog this week. Yes, I will. All right, so let's jump on over to our main topic for this week. And before we bring in Rebecca Heineman, this segment is proudly sponsored by the Elitist Podcast. It's a show where three friends and occasional guests play games about video games, including trivia, game show games, and more. Here is this week's trivia question. What full motion video game starred Arlie Ermey, Deborah Harry, and Corey Haim? I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it. Ryan was doubting you. <laughs> what? No, no, no. Tune in to the Leadest Podcast this Wednesday to hear the answer. You can find the Leadest on your favorite podcast platform, and we'll also have their links in the show notes. This one is redacted. Very good. Mm-hmm. Which it, it's it's a good game is I it? Like the story. <laughs> it, it is it, the only problem with the only problem that i have with redacted is the the interface is not very friendly okay not so you all. take night it's not you take night trap which is very simple you you switch the cameras you press the the button to activate the traps or you press the button to change the color that's it in redacted you have to like press the button to arm the trap, like maybe like there, and there was like several traps in the room. And then you have to like, I guess there's certain pressures. Like you have to press the button once or twice to get the, the, the amount of pressure to go off on this, on this trap. Mm-hmm. And it was so freaking ridiculous. I remember the first time I played it, I'm just like, what? I, I can't, I can't trap anybody. I don't know what the hell's going on. And I even read the manual and it did not do well. <laughs> so you mean Corey Haim is not enough to save it? No, oh, I wish it were. Aww. Rest in peace. If Night Trap is the the pinnacle of it, it's like Night Trap is Pokemon and Redacted is uh, like a knockoff of Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's You're the not level. wrong. But also, we need to give a big congratulations to the Leadist because they just cracked 2,500 downloads. Woo! Congratulations, congratulations. Leadist Podcast. Yeah, that's a big milestone. Great work, friends. So proud. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. So before we bring in Rebecca, does anybody need to use a restroom or go buy a really expensive game for a dollar? 
No, I was told I can't purchase any more games for a little bit. <laughs> Fair enough. What about you, Ryan? What'd you have for lunch? <laughs> I had ramen noodles, so I'm good to go. All right. <laughs> He's on the all kale diet. <laughs> well, let's bring in Rebecca then. Cool. All right. I'll go get her. Well, thank you all for joining us for a very special interview with one of the most influential figures in the history of games. She's an American video game designer and programmer, a longtime veteran of the video game industry, a founding member of the video game companies Interplay Productions, Logicware, Contraband Entertainment, and Old School. She has been a part of the advisory board for the Video Game History Museum since 2011 and is part of the board of directors of LGBTQ plus organization glad not to mention she's considered to be the first ever national video game tournament champion we of course are talking about rebecca heineman first of all rebecca thank you so much for speaking with us today it is an absolute pleasure hey it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you as well thank you for the invitation Absolutely. Of course. So, Rebecca, we wanted to have you on the show because in almost every episode of Gamers Week, we cover stories behind the history of video games. You, of course, have been hugely influential in the history of games, from the inception of esports to developing such classics as Chuck Norris Super Kicks, Wasteland, The Bard's Tale, Out of This World, the Mac and 3DO ports of Wolfenstein 3D, Heroes of Might and Magic 4, Dragon Wars, Bard's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate, and many many more. So we are so excited to hear your stories. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's just the Reader's Digest version. I mean, it's, I work on some of the things. It's like, I actually, sometimes I forget that, oh yeah, I worked on that. <laughs> so if you can remember all the way back then, tell us about how you first got into video gaming. Oh, how I first got into them? This is a really fun story. A friend yes. of mine at school wanted to recruit me to join his church, something called the Mormon Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And Ah. he wouldn't take no for an answer. He started inviting me over to his house and I didn't want to go. But then eventually he was saying like, hey, I got this brand new thing called the Atari 2600. Ooh. Ooh, okay. You had me at a video game. So, Started going to his place and started playing uh, games, but he then started getting frustrated because, you see, I had a natural talent for it, and all of a sudden, every two-player game we played, I wiped the floor with him. (laughs) (laughs) He stopped evangelizing and changed over to a life quest of, he will defeat me. One day, (laughs) he will actually win against me. We played combat. We played air sea battle. We played, then later on was laser blast. But there was one game of note, slot racers. For whatever reason, this game was essentially you're driving a car through a maze and that you fire bullets in the maze and you can go ahead and by using the maze itself, the bullets will um, move around the uh, screen and hit targets that are around corners. And I had the ability to just simply instantly see in the maze where the bullet will go so i could then make a turn go to place line up my shot even though he's like you know 20 different turns in the maze to where he is i would bullseye him and he was like how are you doing this and i just kept slaughtering him with scores being in the neighborhood of like he'd get me like two times i don't get him 15 he joined this group called the atari force it was the atari fan club and by paying your dues they would send you a letter in the mail every month basically with ads for whatever the newest game and of course that's when we got the invite for the atari 2600 space Invaders tournament but me going to his house and destroying this guy and he just was a glutton for punishment with how i got into (laughs) video games now the the irony was that i had a skill i wasn't aware of And that skill was basically being able to see the screen and within an instant recognize all the strategies and how to play the game. So it's one of the reasons why. Now, of course, from my point of view, I thought everybody could do this, which was why when he kept losing, I'm like, you obviously must be losing because how could you miss in such an easy shot? And of course, from his point of view, (laughs) it's like, 
What do you mean easy shot? You had to bank it here, 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 and here to hit me? <laughs> yeah, can't you see the shot? It's like, no. <laughs> I got to say, that's that's very impressive. And uh, clearly, you uh, you have a mind for video games, which I think also kind of led to, to some of the, the future of what you like, you were able to accomplish, which brings me to, to the question about you know, your involvement with the first ever esports tournament in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind walking us through that experience and how you got involved? Well, now we're going to continue the story. When my friend got the letter from the uh, Atari fan club, it was this mm -hmm. big sheet that was, uh, I remember it was gray, it has a big UFO on it. It's essentially the same artwork that's on the box of the Space Invaders game. And it says, here is the Atari National 2600 Space Innovators Tournament. We're holding a regional here in Los Angeles. And the grand prize is like 150 bucks or something like that. And an all expense paid trip to New York. And I'm, I'm like, that's cool. And he's like, you can win. And my answer is, no, I can't win. Because and from my point of view, like, look, the game's so easy. There's going to be people out there. They're going to slaughter me. Right. And he's just looking at me incredulous like, that's no, no, no. He believed in me. So we then, on that Saturday morning, we drove all the way down to Topanga Canyon Plaza, which from where we were, it's like about an almost an hour and a half, two hour drive. Uh, once we got in there, we saw the setup where they had all these like tubes that were like kiosks in which they had an Atari on each side of it and a TV screen up there. And um, the judges and what you had to do is you had to pay a dollar to enter which remember, this is 1980. So a dollar, you know, it's like asking almost 10 bucks today. But right. back then, you had to pay in a dollar. The money was to go to charity. I think it was the Red Cross, but I'm probably wrong. I mean, but I do know the money was for charity. And that once you pay your dollar, they give you a ticket, you get in line. Once you get to the front, you then give the ticket to them. They send you, send you to the next kiosk because... Most people, they only played the game anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds before they were out. What was unknown to anybody was that in order to get people through quickly, you had to play game one in B difficulty. And B difficulty means that your base is actually twice as wide as it normally is. Oh. So, and you only get, you know, three lives, no extras. So you can't get an extra live every 10,000 points. No, that was not part of the rules. It was... Three lives, double wide base, no cheat where, because there was a cheat. If you hold down the reset key, when you turn on the machine, it'll let you fire two bullets at the same time. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> if they said, you, they see you doing that, you're instantly disqualified. And of course, for a vast majority of people, once they start playing the game, because no one ever really played it on B, they were usually killed within 30 seconds. And for those people who are able to survive for a little bit, the aliens would land on you. But for me, I got on there and I said, oh, you're playing B difficulty. Okay, whatever. And I didn't even think anything about it. And I started playing and playing and playing. And I was so bored. I was just having a conversation with my, my judge whose job was to sit there. And he was just, his job was to simply make sure I wasn't cheating. And if I wrapped the score around, because the game was designed with only four digits, so mm -hmm. that if you got right. 10,000 points, it would wrap around. So every time I wrapped around, he would like tally it. One, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And I was saying, so, you know, how'd you get this job? You know, did you drive very far or did you come from the Bay Area? Do you work for Atari? <laughs> you know, asking questions like this. And of course, I did just play the game. Once in a while, like, the aliens would actually hit me with the, with the laser. But then after, I guess, an hour or something like that, hour or so, um, I got distracted for just one moment and then, they landed on me. So at that point, they landed on me. Game was over. And I just turned to the guy and go, so um, was that good? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I don't know, which is an honest answer. And sure. <laughs> so he then what they did is that after you play, he writes down the score onto a sheet of paper that had the alien ship on it. And it says, you know, thank you for participating. Here's your score. He handed me the paper and then I said, thanks. And I walked away. I turned in a score, but you know, it's so low that it's like, you know, 27 or 28. So like no one cares. So that was my whole opinion. No sooner did I leave the area of the velvet ropes. I had these three people come in 
that were kind of smartly dressed, which was unusual for everyone else. And it turned out that they were the people running the contest. And they said, um, can you do us a small favor? And I go, what's that? Can you allow us to not post your score? <laughs> and I go, why? It says, because we don't want to scare off people. <laughs> and, I, and I'm serious. This is what happened. It's, this is what actually happened. And of that's course, great. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But how could my score of 88,000 points um, scare people off? I mean, I get that occasionally. And the only reason I score that high is because I get bored and turn off the game. Um, <laughs> so can everybody do that? But it was like about three o'clock and the whole thing ends around five. So I was hungry. We went over, got some food, came back. And then I noticed that the top score was 22,000 points. And, you know, with the number two score being 12,000 and below 8,000, those are the numbers that were up there on the top 10. And I'm like, wait a minute, where's my score? Oh, that's right. That's right. They didn't want me to post it. <laughs> but then they cleared out everybody except there was one person playing the game and it was still going. So at that point I thought, Oh, well there's the winner right there. But then the aliens landed on them and their score was 44,000 points. Um, at that point, then they put up the top two scores, which was Heinemann at 88,000 something points. And that second score is 20, 44, the next one is 22. And that's what makes it easier to remember because everyone was half, which is kind of a weird right. coincidence. <laughs> At that point, they said, all right, the winner is Heinemann from Whittier, California, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I won. And I just <laughs> my friend, he's jumping up and down like he's got his cancer on fire. And he's all happy. He says, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> so they then came up to me and they asked me for my name, address, phone number, that kind of stuff. I gave all the information to them and said, OK, we'll get a hold of you. And then went home and promptly forgot everything. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't take the, the check and cash it and got 150 bucks, um, but that was it. And it wasn't until about uh, two or three weeks later, I get an overnight letter, which has inside of it the plane ticket and the itinerary in which it really sinks in that, oh, I forgot. I have to go to New York for this thing. <laughs> forgot all about a all expense paid trip to New York. Yeah, all expense paid trip to New York. <laughs> Which goes to the next thing was where Atari really screwed up because you see, when you're the very, very first video game tournament, you don't know anything. So therefore you have no assumptions and those assumptions you do make are all wrong. Example, they never thought that the person who would win the tournament or a tournament would be broke, poor. The other contestants, when they got the ticket, their parents paid for a ticket for themselves to accompany their oh. child to going across the country. Mm. So like the contestant for Hing Ning from San Francisco, his father came, um, the guy from Dallas, his uh, mother came with him, Chicago, I believe it was his mother. And of course, Frank Tetra from New York, he was already local, but it was his dad. I think both, he had both his parents with him, but then I was there and I was by myself. So of course, when I landed and the person, you know, wearing a suit and tie and the card that says Heinemann says, okay, uh, where's your folks? And I go like, what do you mean my folks? You never sent a ticket for them. So you're here by yourself? Says, yes. <laughs> and they're like, oh, how old are you? Not 18. <laughs> <laughs> so Atari was like, well, we can't send this person back and we can't immediately overnight the parents. So we're kind of stuck here. So that's one reason why you notice it's all expense paid trip for two. Because in the event under the unfortunate rules that somebody under 18 wins your prize, the second person is going to be a guardian or parent. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I'm not going to ship my 12-year-old off on a flight across country <laughs> and go participate in a game tournament. It's like, oh, here you go. You won the trip. I can't yeah. go. If anything <laughs> happened to me, like if I stubbed my toe, if I fell down the stairs, um, if someone mugged me, Atari would be liable because they're a company in charge of a 16-year-old. So it's like, uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, we 
they, they took us on a tour of New York. They took us to a fancy restaurant. They, you know, they, they treat us like VIPs. They even had put us in a mm-hmm. stretch limo and it was really, really cool. But then they took us to this hotel next to a building that I think it's called today 30 Rock. But at the time, it was, was called the Time Warner Building, mm-hmm. yep. which, by the way, the hotel had an Atari 2600 and a Space Savers gate in the room. Oh, God. Oh, that's nice. luxury. That's luxury. On that uh, Saturday, they drove us in by limousine to the 30 Rock, took us to the fourth floor, where they took us to like a very nondescript room. On one end was a raged stage... And on that is one long table in which they had the five TVs, the five Atari 2600, and a cute little yellow stuffed Space Invader. Um, And they gave us each a shirt, which had our name and saying, you know, L.A. Regional Champion, Dallas Regional Champion, Chicago Regional Champion. Behind us in that open area were all these folding chairs. I'd say about 100 to 200 of them filled with press. So we had all these newspaper reporters from every single major newspaper in the country. Um, and, of course, in the back, they had a camera from CNN, a cable news network that was only a few months old. And, you know, getting a scoop on the wow. Atari, yeah. the very first Atari National Space Invaders tournament. And at that point, they told us all to hold down the reset keys. And when they said go, we all let go. And, of course, for the first minute and a half, all of our games were synced. So it was really weird hearing that where... All the aliens are going dun 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 dun, you know, in five in dot, stereo dot, stereo, um, because they're, <laughs> but then and of course when the first UFO shows up because in this version of the game the UFO is timed not based on the number of aliens you shoot. So after you right. play for a period of time, then you're the and it was all like reverberating. Uh, but then after our, we each clear our first board, that's when it starts sounding more like an arcade. You know, the beep beep pop pop all random and sure, background sure. noise. And I remember hearing in the background, I guess it was the commentators from CNN, because they were trying to make it sound like some sports events. Like, okay, now the person from Chicago looks like they missed the laser. Uh oh, they got the down. <laughs> you know, and after about five minutes, they just stopped because think about it. Can you commentate space invaders? <laughs> so after about 20 minutes, the aliens landed on the guy from Chicago. Now, Let's preface him. Let's back up a little bit. When we itch- were introduced with each other, you know, Frank was just some, you know, New Yorker. Uh, Hing Ning was this uh, Vietnamese gentleman uh, with this, with, I guess he looked more like a tiger parent, but who knows? But he was very quiet and reserved. Then you had the guy from Dallas who we all call Tex, because kid you not, he came in a 10 gallon hat and he <laughs> with a southern twang. I mean, he literally sounded like he walked off a of Western. But the guy from Chicago, if you ever saw the movie with Adam Sandler called Pixels. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's a character played by Peter Dinklage in which he gets (laughs) introduced to the show. He's got this entourage of girls and he's got this corporate sponsorships and stuff. That's the guy from Chicago. Yes. (laughs) That's how the 80s arcades were. (laughs) Pretty much because what had happened was that. There was a chain in the Chicago area only, but he was wearing a shirt with them and he was bragging about how he's got a a sponsorship deal and that when he wins the tournament, he's going to go ahead and do a line of commercials for this uh, electronics chain. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah, foreshadowing. (laughs) The other four of us were all looking at him like, okay, dude. Well, Guess who was the first person who got knocked out? <laughs> That's got to suck. <laughs> <laughs> All that trash talking and you're the first person out. Bye. He was fifth place. <laughs> <laughs> Come up in, right? Yep. <laughs> the karma was strong with this one. Now, of course, <laughs> since then, he's become a very, um, well, he's become a comedian in the Chicago area. So he's done well for himself. He doesn't need the Circuit okay. City endorsements. But back then it was like, okay, so they... Obviously, model the character after you at Pixels. <laughs> <laughs> well, after an hour and 45 minutes of play, only the guy from Chicago was out. The wow. other four of us wow. were still going and going and going. At this point, the press in the back of the room are all turning into skeletons or writing their wills or putting up nooses because they're like, what have I signed up for? (laughs) Obviously the people from Atari queued in on this. 
So what they then did is that as we were just playing, I just heard over the loudspeaker, and so concludes the first annual Atari 2600 Space Invaders Tournament. The judges <laughs> will now go and tally their scores, blah, 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 and determine the winner. And then I just looked at the uh, announcer and says, does that mean we don't have to play anymore? <laughs> That's right. You don't have to play anymore. And then, of course, I thank my lucky stars in having the forethought of not drinking any water before the tournament mm. started. Because immediately I saw, um, I think the guy from Dallas, it was, got up and ran to the restroom. <laughs> hold it, holding it for a while. <laughs> I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to let my bladder make me lose. No, no, no. I'll be in my chair if I have to. <laughs> I, w- I would have. That's dedication. Yep. yep. But the, the next part is that the prizes, uh, the grand prize was a stand-up asteroids game. Ooh, Second nice. place was a Atari 800 computer with all the fixings. That is, you get a disk drive, a printer, memory expansion card, and a couple of cartridges. And that's what I wanted. That was because, hefty. You know, I, I like computer, and I was poor. And to me, it's like, hey, this may be the only way I could get my hands on an Atari 800 because, you know, I'm broke. So the judges came out and they said, okay, here are the winners. The winners, of course, fifth place goes to Chicago. Well, duh. Fourth place went to the guy from Dallas. Uh, third place went to Frank Petro of New York. And at that point, I'm like, I got an Atari. I got an Atari. And I'm always <laughs> thinking about what am I going to do with it and so forth. And then that's what I said. And the, the Atari goes to King Ning of San Francisco. And I'm like, damn it. Oh, I don't get the like, oh, I'm just sitting there start crying. And then they said that these are champion, you know, Heineman from Los Angeles, the first ever national video game champion. Yay! And I got to stop crying because I got a microphone shoved in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Did you at least try to trade with them for that Atari 800? No, I didn't. Um, because oh. see, the trouble is that once they made the announcements, then I had to be sure. there with the reporters for a while. And the reporters, of course, interviewed everybody. I wasn't the only one. They, they interviewed all five of us separately. Then afterwards, the people from Atari dragged me away. Not, you know, figuratively, not literally. <laughs> right, right, right. They me, <laughs> Come here. They put, had me put on this white shirt with a nice collar and an Atari logo on it. And on the back of the shirt says, National Space Invaders Champion. And then once I put on the shirt, then I had me come back into the room with all the other contestants. And they just have had us pose for a bunch of pictures. You know, me you know, in a chair with the four other ones behind me. One picture with us throwing the space inv- the stuffed space invaders in the air. Um, other, you know, <laughs> other different poses and stuff like that. And so by the time that was all done, they then took us to, I guess, their after party or something like that. It was more like um, hors d'oeuvres than anything else. And at that point, I kind of just didn't see the other contestants. But then that's where I met Arnie Katz, uh, Joyce Worley, and Bill Kunkel, who had just formed a magazine a year ago called Electronic Games Magazine. And of course, being the national video games champion, they want me to write books for them. Right. So what was that like? I mean, that's pretty cool. It was pretty cool. But of course, for me, I had never written a book in my life. And don't forget, I'm quite underage. And I dropped out of high school like two years beforehand. So my skills in writing were lacking. So while the strategy guides, which are really like uh, two or three page, you know, cliff notes is really what I did, what I published inside of the magazine. The two books I ended up doing uh, was called How to Beat the Video Games, and the other one was called How to Beat the Home Video Games. They brought in a writer named uh, Tom Hirschfeld, and he was the one who did the writing, but I was the one who told him, okay, this is the strategy, blah, 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 and we would have all these phone calls. No kidding. And so I would tell him, this is what you got to do, this is what you got to write, this, and I drew some stuff for him and, and stuff like that, and of course, we, I had to mail it to him because fax machines weren't a thing then. Right. Remember, we're talking uh, 42 years ago now. So things like BBSs, modems and stuff. Modems back then were only 300 baud. It's either 110 baud or 300 baud. So, and I remember printing out my documents at first with an Apple silent type printer. And then Arnie Katz had to reject my writings because nobody could read the thermal ink. So I ended up having to buy an Epson MX80 printer 
you know, save a bunch of money, you know, use some of the money I got paid for doing those articles, bought it, dot matrix printer, and then I use that to print the stuff and send it to them. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> lots of phone calls, lots of letters, but that's how uh, those two books came into being. And, you know, it's interesting. We did a, a segment on tips and tricks and, and that kind of thing. And both of those books we talked about, it's amazing to, to learn that, that you were actually involved Open with that. Open up the acknowledgements. You'll find my name in both of them. That's so <laughs> great. That's fantastic. And that's, again, that, that became part of the culture as well, because that was something that was relatively new at the time, uh, was this idea of providing tips and tricks for video games. And then that became an entire industry. It turned into VHS tapes and, and all of these things. And now uh, the internet exists. So a lot of those things kind of went well, away. Remember but the strategy guides were a thing in the 90s and the early 2000s. I remember working absolutely. on games yep. at Interplay where we would actually be working on a strategy guide as we were making the game. Because the intent was the strategy guide would be in the stores on the day that the game shipped so people could buy the game. And they usually bought the strategy guide at the same time. And that was a thing. Oh, absolutely. Blue and myself, especially since we're in our uh, early 40s, we, we got to experience that a lot where you, you, you go oh, get yeah. a brand new game and there was the strategy guide, just like you said, accompanying it on the shelf. And of course, for a highly detailed game, you would more than likely need the strategy guide. Yep. And in many cases, um, we would put in specifically quests or puzzles that you would never, ever know to find, you know, kind of like uh, secrets, right. but they're exactly. in the strategy guide. So it was another <laughs> enticement to get you to buy the strategy guide. And, you know, in many cases, the strategy guide, as soon as the game was into production, the strategy guide was op- as actually part of our design document. Um, and then, of course, when we had the play testers, the play testers are checking the game and using the strategy guide to help guide them through the game. And of course, it was a way to also play test the strategy guide. But these are all things that were done in coordination, which is something that just doesn't happen today. For sure. So how did you get a job working for Avalon Hill at only 16 years old and eventually with the Boone Corporation? An arcade called the Electric Planet Arcade thought it'd be really cool to hire the video game champion to help work, you know, work the arcade. So I went to the arcade and I was there just being the cashier. And for me, it was a really cush job. But then when they found out I could fix the boards, I ended up repairing and maintaining all the circuit boards, which then eventually got me into doing hardware, TTL. And then I made a board for my Apple II that would allow me to copy Atari 2600 carts because I was a real evil <laughs> Yes, I love that. But that then parlayed to the point where I then started reverse engineering the code of the Atari 2600, and I taught myself how to program an Atari. I shared that knowledge with one of my many talks with uh, Electronic Games Magazine when I was doing my articles for them, and they said, oh, you know how to program the Atari 2600? Well, video game companies are willing to pay top dollar for somebody who knows how to do that that we just got approached by Avalon Hill, who asked us if we knew any programmers. So I said, sure, let them know. And so I got this call. Um, I don't remember if it was from Jack or Eric Dot, but it was one of those two. I I think they were both on the line. And they asked me, hey, I understand you program the Atari 2600. And I said, you sure do, blah, blah. I explained the game and explained what I do and explained I made my own dev kit and I did everything like that. And so, so can you build these dev kits? Yeah, just go to Radio Shack. It's about... $50 $50 in parts. It says, would you like a job? Okay. <laughs> and the very next day, I got overnighted a plane ticket one way. Wow. And I then just told my mom, because I was already estranged from her, I packed up everything I owned into a giant steamer trunk and had one of those airport shuttles come to my front door. And when my mom was asking me, where are you going? I just said, out. Got in the car, and drove off, and uh, they flew me to Baltimore, Maryland. And they brought some of their other programmers. And then I just sat down and said, this is the registers. These are the registers. Here's how you do it. Here's some sample code and so forth. And then I went to work uh, going to Radio Shack. And I spent the next two months building something like about eight or nine Atari 2600 dev kits. Basically, just ROM emulators. And we used Apple II computers. And we were making Atari games. And that's how those five um, Avalon Hill 2600 games came into being. But after about nine months... The word of what I was doing at Avalon Hill got word back to HBO, and they recruited me from there to come work for them in New York City to work on a thing called Play Cable. 
And they were the ones designing a board that will allow you to plug a Z80 and 64K of memory into an Atari 2600 so you could play supercharged games. So we spent three months on that. But that's when they notified us that we found that there's a company called StarPath making a StarPath supercharger. And then there's another company making a play cable system. So they canceled it. And it's like, that was my very first layoff. And I'm like, I've had to go through one winter on the East Coast. I've never (laughs) experienced snow in my life. And my answer to that is, nope, big nope. (laughs) Um, So I just took everything I owned. You know, shortly after I was let go, I took everything I owned, put some of it in a large box and just UPSed it home. And the rest of it, I took it again in my steamer trunk, went back to the airport, bought a one-way ticket and flew back to L.A., and all of a sudden, my mom says, hey, where have you been? Eh, I was out. I was out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was only there for a couple of weeks um, because then I started asking. I was saying, hey, no any programming jobs? Because I really do like programming. And that's when a fellow hacker who goes by the name of The Jerk said, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a work at this place called Boom. Maybe you should uh, come join us. And I went there, and I was hired right as soon as I walked in the door. Walk in the door, says, hey, you're a programmer. Yeah, you know the Atari? Yes, I do. Oh, well, they have a seat right there. We'll do the W-2 stuff later. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, kind of looking into to the future, you know, we are, of course, big fans of the company Interplay that you founded with your friends. Uh, what was it like starting your own company? It wasn't that we started the company. It was more like it, we were thrust into it because we were at Boone. Um, I was doing Atari 2600 to BIC-20 and C64 ports, which is where we Mm -hmm. did the Zonix games like Robin Hood, Chuck Norris, Super Kicks, and stuff like that. So I was doing these projects just to bring in money. Mike Boone, our CEO, decided, you know what? I think I can make more money selling, and again, I'm not making this up, popsicles at the swap meet. (laughs) (laughs) Ouch. Oh, wow. So he closed the company down and we were all canned and we were just sitting around the table. Wow. And there's some names you may recognize. Brian Fargo, Jay Patel, yep. Troy Worrell, yep. and myself. We're all sitting <laughs> at the table. We were all employees, are now former employees of Boone. And we're like, well, we're all canned. What do you want to do? Well, why don't we just keep doing what we're doing except without Mike Boone? Because there you go. <laughs> he was selling popsicles, which... Ironically, he made decent money. He actually was right. (laughs) (laughs) So fast forward to 1995. Mm -hmm. And you leave Interplay and start a new company called Logicware. Yep. What was going on around that time in your life that prompted that move? Um, Watching Interplay burn to the ground and having no ability to do anything about it. Oh, no. You see... Interplay was a victim of its own success. When we first founded, we were just a group of friends making games that we wanted to play, and we were having a lot of fun doing it. The first four years of Interplay are some of the happiest years I can ever recall. It was a joy to come into the office. We all had a lot of fun. We had a bit of camaraderie. And you know, while we weren't being paid very well, you know, we all owned a piece of the company. I mean, we, you know, I had stock in the company. It was, uh, we were all founders and we were all owners. And we were doing this because, you know, it made enough money that we could at least eat fairly. But we were having fun. But then we started having success. As we started making hit games. Mind Shadow and Tracer Sanction made a lot of money. Borrowed Time made a lot of money. Task Times and Tone Town made a lot of money. But then... We were able to be the ones to do Bard's Tale. Right. And that's the game that essentially had a bulldozer, figuratively speaking, drive up to our parking lot and push a pile of money burying our cars. (laughs) Well, once that occurred, we started doing, you know, expansioning out, building the company, doing more development and so forth. And we started hiring people like crazy and doing all these other projects for mostly other people, like Rad Gravity, which was a, a game for, I think, for Konami. And, of course, you know, doing um, Bard's Tale 2 for Electronic Arts. Because, you know, even though we created Bard's Tale, it, because of the deal we did with Electronic Arts, the intellectual property actually belongs to Electronic Arts, not to us. Mm-hmm. So we did get quite a bit of money, but it's one where we still weren't a publisher. Well, 
unfortunately, due to the fact we were making all this money, um, certain people at the company started paying themselves an obscene amount of money and started living really rich lifestyles and kind of forgot that it was the other people who also who made the games and not them. Right. Mm. But, you know, we didn't really care. The games are still coming out. We were still having fun. But as time goes on, it was becoming less and less fun because even though we were making all this money, we were spending it as fast as we were getting it. Right. So therefore, it started becoming a crisis every freaking quarter because in around 1994, Four, we needed a lot of money and we did a deal with MCA, otherwise known as Universal Pictures, in which they bought 45% of Interplay for $45 million. So they valued our company wow. at uh, $100 million, which is not that bad. Not It was pretty much right. But now we have corporate overlords. Right. I worked on a bunch of hit games that made the company millions, but I can tell you right now, in the 11, sorry, 11 and a half years I worked at Interplay, I never got a bonus. Never Jeez. once. Never got a bonus. And secondly, I worked for three years at Interplay when we first founded it. I never took a vacation. And then when I did take a vacation, I kind of forced the issue. I literally took a, a world globe and I ended up going to Sweden. And it's because I just wanted to, do something, just go away for just a little while. I was on my vacation for only three days. I get a call from, you know, a manager at Interplay demanding that I have to come back immediately because they had some project that was on fire and they needed me to fix it. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, um, you. (laughs) (laughs) Really that when I did that one phone call and had to tell them to screw off was when it really started changing for me that is this person really my friend or not? Right. Well, then, as time went on, we did this game called the Interplay 10th Anniversary CD. Originally, the concept was to take a bunch of our old games, just copy them onto a CD, put a DOS text-based installer, and call it a day. Well, Scott Campbell had this idea of doing the histories of the game, a nice graphical interface, and I said, let's do that. And I went ahead and did the coding. He did all the design. It was a beautiful product. And then we shipped it, and it turned out to be 60% of our revenue for 1993. Wow. Did not get a bonus? No. Did I get a bonus? No. But there was a company meeting where everybody got together, and the C-level executives were on a podium, and then one person comes up and says, hey, I want to personally thank the people who made this year the one of our best years ever because the Interplay 10th anniversary was 60% of our revenue. And I want to personally thank Kim Motika and Trish Wright for their hard work. Oh. oh my goodness. And they went up on stage, got these little awards. Well, Scott and I were standing in the back and we were like, well, we're going to brush up on our resumes. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) That right there, that event was the final straw as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. So then moved on in 1995. Now, because of the MCA buyout deal, they bought a bunch of my stock. So I got finally a bunch of money in the bank. And that was the money I used to found Logicware. Nice. And Logicware was just not me. There was a gentleman. I I got a business partner and he and I uh, founded Logicware together. Gotcha. Yep. So, Rebecca, can you tell us what it was like being transgender while working in an industry that hasn't traditionally had much representation from the trans community? Terrifying. You see, I didn't come out until about 2003, especially because at Interplay, the C-level executives were homophobic and misogynistic. And, of course, because I looked like a guy at the time, they didn't have a problem being in front of me as they're talking to each other about how cute the secretary looks and about what they want to do with her and blah, blah, blah. Granted, they never did anything as far as I'm aware to her. The fact that they talked about it tells you their character. Sounds like another video game company that we've heard of. (laughs) (laughs) So many video game companies that, that the story just keeps different days, different years, different locations, same story. But the issue was that another employee who was far braver than I came out at Interplay as trans. And they basically outwardly were open and welcoming, 
but behind the person's back, oh, they hate, they were just saying so many derogatory things. And that, of course, kept me in the closet because, like, oh, my God, if they only knew my secret. I needed to feed my family because at that time I had kids. I had family. Could right. not afford to lose this job or basically lose the ability to do this work because I did have no idea what I'd be doing instead. Where would I work? So right. – I, I kept my mouth shut and it wasn't until I eventually ended up at electronic arts in 2003 when the first thing I did shortly after orientation was that I read in their HR guide, here is our policy on transgender people. We are to be welcoming. And if any employee causes you trouble, that employee is terminated. So in other words, it is a firing offense for you to say or do anything derogatory towards a trans employee. And I'm like, Maybe I can get do this. So I came out to some friends at work. I came up to some other friends. Um, then I came up to my manager. And then sure enough, true to their word, you know, some people think Electronic Arts is an evil empire. But when it came to EA Los Angeles, the studio, they were like the most welcoming and most caring company I have ever done because they made me feel welcome. And they made me feel comfortable in my own skin. You know, because I was prepared Well, the moment I told my manager that I was probably going to be fired within 24 hours. I was totally wow. prepared for that. But that's not wow. what happened. Well, we only think EA is an evil empire because of all their DLC decisions and stuff like that and their pay to play. <laughs> um, but it sounds like they did something right as far as how they handled transgender people um, back in the early 2000s. Yep, they did. And I will always be thankful for them for that. Now, granted, the DLC things, yeah, I'll grit my teeth on that one. But the <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to HR and how they treat some employees, I can, I can only speak for the EA Los Angeles team who worked on Battle for Middle Earth 2 and Medal of Honor European Assault, because those are the teams I were on. And the mm -hmm. manager, uh, Mike Klasinski, I think his name was, five stars would work for him in a heartbeat again. He was the most understanding, most caring, most understanding manager I have ever worked under, period. Awesome. It's good to hear. So kind of looking forward here and, and really speaking to, to some folks who are interested in kind of doing what you've done with your career, what advice would you offer to aspiring game developers? Um, for one, hard work and patience. There is yeah. no free ride here. There is no such thing like some people think in video game commercials or just TV shows that all you do is have an idea and then all of a sudden in an afternoon you have a video game and then you could ship it in a week. That's so far from the truth. It's hilarious. <laughs> it is 12 hour days, six day weeks, a very, very slow progress. But when you finally do make the game that you want to play, and then people respond to it, there's no feeling like that in the world. The sense of pride, knowing that people are enjoying the something that you really enjoy creating. That's what moves me. That's what motivates me all the time in creating new games, new experiences, new code. And my podcast, Burger Time, is just one where just sharing what I know and just knowing that people appreciate what I am creating because that's what I never got at Interplay. <laughs> 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 now, however, exclusively for your minority and female readers or listeners, mm -hmm. there will be more detractors. Ignore them. They're just trolls. Like if you're on Twitter and you're talking about your game and someone up there is just basically talks about your bra size or your skin color yeah. or some derogatory thing, there's a block button and or just ignore them. Do not engage. And remember that these people are just trolls. Right. Work right. with your fans. You will get fans. They're the ones who really matter, not the trolls. Don't let the trolls uh, tear you down because that's all they're there for is that they get their jollies taking people down. And especially Absolutely. when you're talking about someone who's a minority of some kind or a woman. That's great advice. And heaven help you if you're both. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great, great experience getting a chance to hear the history of your influence on gaming from your perspective. So thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Hey, thank you very much. Um, for those who want to follow me on Twitter, Reddit, whatever, um, Burger Becky, B-U-R-G-E-R-B-E-C-K-Y. My company is old school, O-L-D-E-S-K-U-U-L, of course, dot com, on Twitter, et cetera. And I hope to hear from you soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. And for those who are curious, I also do a comic book called Sailor Ronco. If you're into Ronma one half and Sailor Moon and wondered what happened if those two met, you can go read the comic. And SailorRonco.com, R-A-N-K-O. And you've done more than just one fan fiction, right? Yeah, I've done uh, several dozen, and I have a couple of original novels coming out. And I've also got an original comic book coming out in about three months called Cynthia One. Nice. Awesome. Perfect. Yep. Well, thank you again for for joining us, and we really appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. Hey, take care. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you so much. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up this episode of the Gamers Week podcast. Thank you for listening to episode 23. And a big thank you to the Retro Game Club podcast, the latest podcast, and Love Retro BTW for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. And if you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Email us at Gamers Week Podcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com. Or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the link in the show notes. Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. And finally, since you made it all the way to the end of this episode, please leave us a rating and a review to let us know how we did. We really do value your feedback. While you're there, consider subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. I'd hate to leave you, but I really must say, oh, good night, good night, good night. Bo, 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 bo. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that song? Do you know what song I'm talking about? Of course, of course. What's I don't know where I don't know where it's from, but oh. that, that definitely <laughs> rang a bell. Three men and a baby. Oh, Jesus. Tom I Selleck. I saw that movie in the theaters. <laughs> did you wow. really? <laughs> yes, I did. When did that come out? <laughs> A long time oh, ago. Oh, like 80, 87. I was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. All right, I'll stop recording. <laughs>